Thank you so much. Thank you, Alice, for being here. Thrilled to have you. Super excited. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you? Great. On this summer's night, as we say. Uh, I admire your boots. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I want to begin with a question that's uh, in part prompted by this place, by Pioneer Works, this kind of art factory as it's sometimes described. Uh, and that's a question about being a student and being a learner. And this is a place that's, that's predicated in certain ways on sort of ideas about what it is to be a learner, what it is to be an institution of learning. It's a little different from Harvard, this place, but those questions are sort of attending it. And you as someone who's written now not, not one or two, but three books really about being a student, different phases of life, fiction, nonfiction. But I wonder if you could just talk about the ways in which being a student, whether as a vocation or a season of life, seem to lend themselves for you to literature or to the kind of writing that you have done. I guess I, th I think about writing as, um, I also really like detective fiction and the idea that you're in the world and you're looking for clues and they're going to add up is, it's, it's really the same thing as, um, I think that's how Sidin talks about it in Either Or, is that she's, our only job is to look for clues. Um, I guess I've always had a feeling that there has to be something more to life than like, you know, this table, so there has to be something underneath it, and how am I going to learn, and um, yeah, it's, it's really, it's, it's how I view the world, which was always through the frame of books, and um, I guess education is just a good metaphor for that. Yes, um, and I wanted, to, I wanted to ask you too about, this book, of course, either or, it sort of picks up someone who we've met in The Idiot, now it's sophomore year, she's in Cambridge, she's at Harvard, uh, and it finds her sort of wrestling with various things, books and sex and love and sort of ideas about herself and the story of her life. But I also sort of was struck by, there's a moment in the book when she kind of voices this, this frustration or sort of disillusionment with college, essentially, and saying, you know, I came to this place and I thought maybe people would have plans for life that were not just figuring out how to make money and finding someone to reproduce with and using the money to pay for the kids you have and then feeling like, oh, this is kind of everyone's plan at this place. And I, I, read, uh, I read the book last spring and I happened to be at a, at a college reunion and this was, this was sort of striking home. I was like, oh no, this was kind of people's plan. Um, but do you recall, was that very much sort of drawn from life in the sense that that was something you felt uh, as a student, as a sophomore or otherwise? Yeah, I, I definitely felt that. I was, I mean, when I look back, I was, I was so obsessed with getting into Harvard, and you know, a lot of it was sort of compensation for my parents, which I think was the case for um, a lot of uh, children of immigrants who who were there, a lot of whom were were my friends. But um, but a lot of it was just this idea that there had to be some actual way to, which you know, it, it might also come from immigrant experience, which involved for me seeing that there were very different ways of approaching life in the US and in Turkey where we would go every year. So it was like, I had the idea that there's more than one way of doing things and yet all of the people who I saw, all of the adults that I saw, I, I, I gave Selin my, my actual thoughts about this, which were like, you know, whenever you would suggest to someone, why don't you, why don't you do this thing or why don't you go on this trip or why don't you live here? they would like laugh at you and be like, ha ha ha, I have to go to work tomorrow. Like otherwise who's gonna like pay for my kids to go to school? And she was like, well, so why, why do you have to do that? And what's the point? And, and I, I think I, I really did think that the name Harvard was kind of this like fancy brand name for some kind of like excellence. And what I thought that would map onto would be that people there would have some alternate idea about how to live and some other plan. Um, and it was really disappointing to get there and to find out. And, and to, so you would be talking to someone and then you would be like, oh, this is a reasonable, and then it was like a, it's like a horror movie. And at some point they're like, oh, you know, like I have to do that now, like have to travel now because uh, then I'm gonna get married and have kids. And you're like, what, you too? And <laughs> yeah. yeah, one has that conversation many, yeah. many a time. Uh, and 
This book is, is predicated, as you say, it's very much about books, of course. Ellen is someone who is shaped by books, who's obsessed by books, is sort of moved by them in this profound way. They're exciting to her, right? And the epigraph of the book, in fact, is from, from Proust, right? And there's this sort of, uh, I'm not gonna, I can't do it verbatim, but essentially it's that we learn across all the sort of seasons and moments of our life, but there's something about adolescence or late adolescence that is sort of laden with epiphanies or sort of shock or surprise. Um, why'd you choose that for the epigraph of the book? That's the, that's the epigraph to the idiot, and it's about there. There isn't when we look back at our adolescence, there isn't one moment in that whole time that we wouldn't give everything to be able to take back, and yet we're wrong when we think that way because actually that was the only time when we're able to learn anything. Um, so for me, and the, the epigraph to either or is is more about like your previous question because it's about it's from Kierkegaard and it's like, um, isn't it a pity and a shame and and a I, a shame and isn't it a shame that that books aren't written that teach a person how to live, um, which is which is what I went to college wanting to learn, and then I was again disappointed to find out that that's not actually what you learn in school. The the Proust epigraph was um, that came because I, I I wrote the first draft of the Idiot when I was really close to that time of life and. Um, when I was in grad school in California and was um, at that time unable to pull it into a novel and I sort of um, dug it up in my late 30s under duress when I had to turn in a different novel and wasn't able to. And at that point, the thing that made me, I was just able to to recognize it was a novel, and, and I realized that what had been holding me back was the thing that Proust was talking about, which was the shame. I, I happened to be rereading Proust at that time. Um, yeah, and I, I just realized how, how ashamed I'd been of all of the things that were in that book and how I, I didn't have to be, which was also a, a product of many years of therapy. Yes, this is important, this is in here. Um, so yes, Proust being the epigraph for the idiot, Kierkegaard, the epigraph for either or. Let's talk about the title of this book and that essay. Someone said to me, they sort of glimpsed the book today and said, oh, did, did she get the title from Elliot Smith? <laughs> and I said, oh no, that's so good, I'll ask her, but I think it's, from, I think it's Kierkegaard. Um, but let, let's talk, maybe there's a little Elliot Smith in there too, and I wanna talk about music. But uh, let's talk about either or, Kierkegaard, and this sort of uh, opposition or dichotomy that's set up between the aesthetic and the ethical. Uh, this being a work of philosophy, not a novel, which Celine tends to sort of turn to as the sort of books that are the stories of, of, of her life that she wants to sort of draw on. But Kierkegaard's philosophy. So talk about, talk about that book and what it meant for you and perhaps for this character. Yeah, that part, um, everything about either or in the book either or is quite autobiographical. I was really obsessed with that book. Um, in my second year of college. Um, it's true that Céline, um, like me, it, you know, when you look at books for how to live, uh, I think kind of a theme in both The Idiot and Either Or is sort of a disappointment with philosophy, which I also experienced, um, which is I thought that philosophy seemed like what was going to be the discipline that's about how to live your life, and then it actually feels like it's not about that. It's about some kind of like abstract exercise sort of based on that in some way, but, um, which actually I did a lot of, I did a lot. I did some amount of reading while I was writing either or, and I now actually have a whole theory about that, which is that um, I was reading about Kant's childhood and Kierkegaard's childhood, and they were like awful. And I, you know, I was just thinking like how much of the great edifice of Western philosophy is the coping me mechanism of abused children. But so for whatever reason, I think with, um. <laughs> that's, that's where it's a prize. For whatever reason, the novels were the books, like starting with Anna Karenina, it, it's, it seems really clearly a book about how to live, right? There's like two examples, there's two couples, there's Kitty and Levin and Anna and Vronsky, and one is illustrating one thing and the other is illustrating the other, and it's, uh, that was really exciting to me. That was what pulled me into novels, and um, so either or, Kierkegaard is like, a, he's an interesting and idiosyncratic philosopher in that you, either or kind of is a novel or it has a lot of novelistic aspects to it. It contains a little mini novel called Diary of a Seducer, which is um, part of what pulls Céline 
in. Um, sometimes, so, so either or, it's a book that's in two parts. Um, Kierkegaard often writes with a pseudonym and pretending to be other people. So one half is supposed to be by one person and the second half is supposed to be by another person and he's supposed to have found the whole thing in an old desk. And half of it is about how you should live an aesthetic life, a life that's like a work of art. And the second half is how you should live an ethical life, which is a life based on being a good person. And it's uh, and these two things are supposed to be like totally opposites, and there's no way you can do both of them at the same time. And the only way to live an a life that's a work of art is by being like a complete asshole, which is something that we were all kind of rethinking during Me Too, which is the period when I wrote this book. So that you know, part of it was about wanting to to revisit that, um, because now I think that all of this is completely misguided, and that you actually, um, I think Simone de Beauvoir in The Ethics of Ambiguity shows that you cannot live an aesthetic life that is not also ethical, which is something we could talk about, but uh, that's not what you asked about, so I, I guess I won't talk about it. But I think so the that reason works. that Céline gets really obsessed with that book is because it's, um, it's so clearly about, so Céline and her friend Svetlana decide that one is gonna live the ethical life and the other is living the aesthetic life. And I mean, one reason that they really get into this schema, I think, is, um, you know, and that relationship is based on a real friendship, and to some extent, I've, I've talked about it with her, and um, I was like, you know, why did we choose this, like, stupid schema? And, you know, it was, it was so that we wouldn't be competing, because competition and rivalry is really what erodes these friendships, these really close friendships, I think especially between women, but probably between, for boys, too, that was for girls. Yeah. yeah, and and that <laughs> and that fair enough. It gave us an out because it was like, oh, you're doing the ethical life and I'm doing the aesthetic life, and we're gonna see. We're like now we're partners. We're gonna see what's and and it was one of the few books that was actually you know trying to tell you how to live. Right, right. And there's a it, it's very interesting that they this pair right Svetlana and Svetlana sort of enact these things and sort of figure figure them out together. But one of the ways in which they do so right is this the opposition that's set up in Kierkegaard, or certainly between them, is that the so-called aesthetic life becomes a sort of life of, of hedonism or sort of a pursuit of sex, and essentially as an end in and of itself. The quote, ethical life sort of ends in marriage, basically, right? Yeah, it's, it's a, the aesthetic life is a string of fascinating love affairs that was defined as like, you know, heteronormative, penetrative situation. And the ethical life is marriage and children, which is one long, boring marriage and children. That's the choice between the aesthetic yes. and the ethical. Yeah, and one of the things that, that Celine sort of struggles with as well, or, or it seems clear that, you know, having spent this sort of previous year, which we read about in The Idiot, she goes to Hungary, because she's interested by this guy who's interesting. There's never a sort of, quote, consummation in this sort of fascination, mutual exchange, whatever it is. Uh, and in the second book, in Either Or, Right, there's a moment early on where she says, sort of, how and where did I lose the thread of the story of my life, right? And one solution that it seems that she comes to, which is basically about the sort of novels that she's obsessed with and interested in, and also Kierkegaard a bit, but it's essentially when does, and I think I've, I've heard you say this really eloquently, when does the story of a young woman become, when does the life of a young woman become a story, right? And in all these books that she is sort of most interested by, the conclusion she kind of reaches is, oh, there's a moment of, it becomes a story when there's a guy involved, basically. And when... Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and when sex is involved, essentially. So she sort of says, okay, if I want to be a story... Penetrative intercourse, yes. Penetrative intercourse. <laughs> to, That's to be what technical. makes it a story, yeah. That's what makes it a story, the penetrative. <laughs> there it is. Uh, Talk about her experiences of uh, penetrative intercourse. <laughs> not as not as thing in and of itself, but as idea and aftermath. What does it do, what does it do for her? Vis-a-vis -vis being a story. Well, you know, I while I was writing this book, I got very into the work of Celine Siama, who's a feminist French filmmaker, and she talks a lot about um, what. You know the 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 extent to which the conventions of storytelling that we think of as universal are actually the products of this heteronormative kind of patriarchal worldview that's not really serving. It's not like oh, me men got it the way they. No one. It's not serving anyone, and it's kind of like random and arbitrary. So that was one strand in my mind, and another was I had been on 
book tour with the idiot, and there were actually readers who were really distressed by the lack of consummation at the end of The Idiot. And, um, and this was all over the world. Like, I remember The Idiot came out in Norway, and like someone called me on the phone from a newspaper in Norway, and she was like, you know, I just, I have very few questions for you. I just have to ask, um, you know, for us in Scandinavia, it's very strange that these, these college students aren't having sex with each other. And I was wondering if that's she a- She says, you, you let us on. Yeah she, yeah, she was like, was this a commentary on American Puritanism? <laughs> You know, I noticed they're in Boston, but so, yeah, and like, <laughs> and like, you know, one girl came to me at a party, and she was like, she was really mad, like she was, she was really angry, um, and other people were kind of confused by it, and then, and and some reviewers also, and I, I remember thinking like that, what a peculiar thing for uh, for the reviewer to focus on is like why and people would ask me like why why did you decide against having a sex scene and it was like you know it was so closely based on my experience and I didn't have sex in my freshman year of college like it didn't occur to me to like why would I like have a glorious sex scene and, and then but so I, <laughs> for the review for that guy like <laughs> but, but so and then I was like, oh, like, what is this familiar feeling that I'm feeling when I answer this question? And I was like, oh, it's reminding me of my second year of college, which is when I went to school and I was like, and people were like, so what happened in Hungary? Did anything happen? And having the feeling that like all of this stuff happened, so much stuff happened and having to say nothing happened because what they meant was like, you know, the thing didn't go in, which is what makes a woman's life into a story. And then she, you know, I got, I was, I really read either or and read Diary of a Seducer and I was like, oh, I, you know, I screwed up. I fucked up. So, so Céline reaches this decision that she, she has to make something happen. Her time is running out. She has to find a way to become a writer and she isn't doing it right so far. And the thing that she's done wrong is to, you know, that nothing has happened. So she sets out to like make things happen and as you can imagine, it doesn't go great, you know, because that's not the, you know, yeah, it, it's, that's not Sometimes the- Sometimes it doesn't go great, yeah. Yeah, and like, I mean, she's not doing it because she wants to do it. It's, that's it, like, I don't know. Sometimes with this book, people are like, oh, in the second book, she finally follows her desires. And that's not really how I thought about it. I didn't think she's following her, I mean, she's kind of following her desire to be a writer, but like, she's really going through this whole unnecessary thing that's not really fun for anyone. Right, <laughs> right. And there, there's a moment too in the book where she's really sort of wrestling too with this idea, this is sort of incipient sense of her writer-ness, right? Of this is something that she's drawn to, that she wants to do, that, that feels important. But there's also these moments where she says, I've, I've sort of been taking notes, I've sort of been writing about the people I'm around. I can do that, I can sort of write perceptively and accurately about things I'm experiencing and have done. And, but what gets called kind of creative writing is, oh, you're supposed to make up people or sort of give them arcs of desire and all these things that don't actually come easy to her. Uh, and I wanted to ask you, uh, because you spent so many years and still do write a lot of nonfiction, if that kind of sense of what it is to write these books, these sort of marvelous books that are novels, uh, but are drawn closely from life, right? Is that sense that, that some of the voices in the book about, oh, I can, I can write about things I know and people I know and things I've experienced, but writing about things that are completely from Mars or from someone else's life is tricky. Yeah. Is that something that still resonates for you? Yeah, it really does. I, increasingly, I think there's two kinds of novel writers because I meet, I don't know, I remember talking to this, talking to a novelist who was describing this novel that she had written that was based on, you know, her husband's sister had married this much older guy at a time when it was kind of like hot that he was older and then he became very decrepit and she became the nurse and, but she was like, but of course I had to change it. So in, you know, in real life he was a filmmaker and I made him uh, the head of this NGO and I was like, well, but like, 
what about his films? Like, do you, you didn't, then you have to leave out the films. And she was like, what? And I was like, like you don't get to include his films. She's like, why would I want to include his films? They were dreadful. And I was like, that's just like, it's a different kind of person. And like, she was like, I, I she felt liberated by not having to write about, but I know that if it was me, I would want to understand the relationship between, I would want to watch all those movies, you know? So basically, I, I only ever wanted to write as a, I don't, I don't know, to what extent, where, where the fork in the path comes, because I assume that for everyone writing is a meaning making project, but, but so for me it was always like, people were saying crazy stuff from all, and it, it didn't add up, everything was contradicting every, everything else, and when I read Anna Karenina, I was like, oh, this is like, because that whole book is everyone is talking at cross purposes and has different you know, intentions and different ideas of what's good and nobody's actually wrong. And, and then the end is it makes this wonderful tapestry of it. It's, you know, the ending isn't disorder and chaos. It's a wonderful work of art. And that was why I wanted to become a novelist was I wanted to be able to make form and to understand and to process the things that actually happened to me. And then I remember getting to a creative writing class and being like, you know, they were like, uh, you know, teaching you how to invent a character, like, oh, think about what their favorite color is and like, where do they go on the weekend? And everyone, all these girls in the class were writing about these like, a 45 year old man who likes to go to diners. And I was like, <laughs> what are you talking about? Like, and then I was like, you know, I already have like uh, up to here with stuff that I can't understand from my own life. And on top of that, I'm supposed to invent some other person and then like care about them. It just, <laughs> <laughs> and it felt, to me, it felt like censorship. It felt like I wasn't allowed because when I would write about myself, I felt lame. I felt lame that the people I was writing about turned out to be Turkish because I was like, it's just like, why can't I write something more universal? And like, I don't want to be one of these people who's always like, oh, my grandmother, oh, the food, you know, like, <laughs> I, 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 I wanted to be like Anna Krent. I wanted to be like Tolstoy. But um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, that, that was quite autobiographical. Yeah, indeed. Um, <laughs> Speaking though of, of sort of character, um, and we were chatting beforehand about both of us teach and have taught, and one thing that so often comes up in sort of writing classes is, you know, we talk about voice all the time. And say, okay, what is it to have a voice? How do you figure out a voice? It's this mysterious thing you work at for years and you figure out or you don't. But I wanted to ask you about the sort of question of character in a way, that I think it's something who people who don't write nonfiction don't often think about that when you're writing nonfiction, you're also creating yourself as a character, right? That you, that's how it works. And we think about that in fiction, we don't think about it in nonfiction. But I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about the ways in which when you're writing a nonfiction piece or when you were working on The Possessed, if that sort of question or that sort of idea in your, in your ear of sort of what is, what is the character I'm creating? Is this sort of character working? Does that work in the same way? Does it happen in the same way as when you're writing in the voice of Celine? That's so interesting, I haven't, I haven't thought about that. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, a problem I had with the first draft of The Idiot, the one that I wrote in, in grad school was it had this kind of like suffering put upon beleagueredness that I associated with women's writing and that I didn't want to do myself. And I, I just had these really complicated feelings about it, about what it meant. And I, I, I wasn't reading writing by women and there was something about that. Um, I, I read Anna Akhmatova who has a super beleaguered self-presentation of like, uh, my husband, I put on my most narrow skirt. I, it, it's, and like, she's super sexualized and, and she's always suffering. And, um, and there was some element of that and it, it freaked me out and it, it wasn't fun and I didn't feel like I, I wanted to read it. And then, so I, I remember what I would read to kind of counteract that and it was, it was Raymond Chandler and Haruki Murakami. And there was, especially Haruki Murakami, like the Wind Up Bird Chronicle, I read that book like a thousand times because he's so unbeleaguered, like no matter what happens, it's gonna be the most beleaguering thing and he's just like, oh, okay, and like. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he's funny and, but like chill and the, I don't know, I just found it like, I think you need to read specific, or for me, I find that I have certain qualities that I don't like in my own writing that I can sort of counteract by reading, you know, you read something else to counteract it. And I think that that was at the, the stage when I got to The Possessed, um, 
I think what helped me find both the voice and the character was this is someone who's just sort of like bemused by everything and sort of thing they, they kind of are put upon, but they're not really feeling it that way. And, and they're they're kind of like, oh, let me see where that goes, or you know, what's what's this next thing? And yeah, that really opened something up for me. I wouldn't say that I think about it that differently from fiction and nonfiction. Although no, I do because so I mean that. I actually wanted The Possessed to be a novel, and it was sort of for marketing reasons that it was a nonfiction book, which was a whole other story. But that, I mean, that that mode of being, I think, um, with some adaptation, I used for journalism. I did have some after after The Idiot came out, um, and I was doing this promotion, and I was, you know, consuming all of this feminist content and my eyes were being opened and my third eye could see. And, uh, you know, I was uh, having all these political realizations. I was like, no, I need to explain everything. So I started trying to write essays. And that essay writing self, I just couldn't, I, I don't know if it's like I'm going to crack it later and I just didn't do it yet or if there's something about the essay. But it was like this like person who's talking from a place of like knowing everything and explaining it. And that person's just like a pain in the ass. Like no, one, no one's going to want to read it. I don't want to do it. And then Selin Selin as the person who doesn't know anything, who could just be like, huh, so this person said this, and this person said the exact opposite, and then I read this book that was kind of like a thing between two of them, and like, and that and everyone says this other thing is true, and yet here's this observation, hmm. And then like, you know, she doesn't have to say, you know, she's not like, she doesn't have the eco-feminist like answer to that or whatever. Um, that was no, it really works, she, she guides us through these ideas and that questioning, and, and it's a, a character that works for that deeply. Um, I wanted to ask you, because you just spoke about the sort of ways in which The Idiot began as this thing you, were, you started writing when you were 23 or sort of right out of college. And there's those wonderful moments in The Possessed where you're sort of, oh, I think I want to be a writer. And you sort of go to these bizarre residencies and retreats and MFA talks. And like, this is what being a writer is? This seems, this seems this horrid. This squalor, this, <laughs> this abject squalor. Squal this doesn't seem like the thing. So I'm going to go to Stanford and study Russian literature. Uh, but then you picked it up later you know, um, 10 or 15 years later and turned it into this novel. Uh, either or, of course, you're writing about a similar period in life, but now being sort of a couple decades in the past. And one of the ways, one of the things that sort of comes out in the book, there's all this wonderful, call it sort of materiality of memory, you know, the sort of the stuff and ephemera that you attached memories to. And of course, books are in here. But I wanted to ask you about, about music in particular, because this is a book either or, um, there's quite a bit of music in it, and there's ways in which you sort of compare music to a lot of different things that she's, that Celine is thinking about. Um, and when I think about sort of being in college in the 90s, I think about a couple things. One is like, you know, the word Facebook, it's a hard sort of generation, it's like that actual Yeah, it was thing. an actual book, yeah. It was an actual, th hours of entertainment, right? You just look at it, all these faces, and you're like, oh, we come up with nicknames for everyone, right? Like, and there's so many choices seem to have gone into like, what is the picture? What there is was like picture? one person who just had a picture of their dog and you're like, what does that mean? What's up with what that, that guy? Mean? Obviously it's a guy. Someone has a, a bow tie, we called him Glamour Shots. <laughs> it was like skinny head, fat head, all these like before the internet, we just looked at yeah. it. But another thing that was sort of a constant was the Fugees. Oh yeah. The Fugees, I was like, I think a year or two, Mind you, so it was like actually the Lauren Hill record was the one that was right. on at the end of every mm -hmm. of every party. But the Fugees play a big role in your um, yeah. in this book. If you want to talk about the Fugees, that's great. But I wanted to ask you about: Do you put on music when you're sort of writing, ever? And in particular, did you put on you know Fugees records or Elliot Smith <laughs> records or something else of the time when you were writing? Um. I did, you know, I was in Italy and I, uh, with the idiot and, um, and someone said, oh, is there going to be another book? And I was like, yeah, it might be called either or. And she was like, I love that Elliot Smith album. So I listened to it then and it actually came out that year. And like, I'm familiar with Elliot Smith. I didn't know that album. So I, I did listen to it, but, um, it didn't, it didn't click, which is, which is part of what, so the, the idiot I wrote when I was still sort of in that mental space and part of what I was, I started either or a little bit before I turned 40, like the year I turned 40. And a lot of it was about, I don't know, the project for me 
I think a lot of people turning 40 revisit their 20s, and it was also 2017, it was the Me Too year, so like a, a lot of women were revisiting their early, and, and there was kind of like a cultural visiting of the 90s. Um, anyway, I was thinking a lot about different ideas of um, youth and middle age and the difference between them, and, and some of them are true, and and some of them aren't, and then even the ones that are true, are they culturally conditioned, or are they, is that somehow the way that it has to be? And one idea that we have is that um, you don't feel emotions as strongly, and you know, your, your life just becomes, the, the emotional register becomes much narrower, and you become sort of dead inside. And I was like, yeah, I mean, that's kind of happened. And, and I was like, you know, but like, in, in good ways and in bad ways, because I don't think I could, you know, like, I, I, I don't think I could survive that anymore. Um, but, but one thing I was really thinking about was music, that, that the connection that music has, and it's like, there's some direct connection to sex, like a music sex loop that is like so active at that late teens, early 20s, and it, and those circuits just get formed, and I, I really did want to, um, I wanted that to be in the book. I, I'm not able to write while I listen to, I almost never listen to music, sometimes like instrumental music. Sometimes I listen to movie soundtracks because, um, or you know, I was, wa I was um, watching the HBO, um, My Brilliant Friend, which has kind of a very like understated yeah, soundtrack. Yeah, I like Ferrante. And I, and I would listen to that soundtrack, which I think if it hadn't been that, soundtrack to that show. I'm not sure that as a piece of music I would have listened to it, but there was something about like remembering that that music was advancing a story that I felt like gave me some kind of momentum. But while I was taking like walks and jogging, I was definitely listening to the Fugees and Fiona Apple and I like back to that time. And, and the, the really, um, cause some of those songs sort of like your, your rotation from that age, it kind of stays with you. But like the real finds for me were songs that I listened to at that time and then never listened to again, because then you listen to it and it can just put you into that place. And then you're like, well, that's still there. Like it's clearly still accessible. I'm walking around, I'm looking at like, you know, that's a 2021, you know, helicopter from, you know, stuff that's happening in 2021. And I'm, and I'm listening to, I'm having the feelings from then. And yeah, I find that really powerful. Oh, nice. Because that, there are. That proves that it's culturally conditioned, like that we do have access to those things and we're telling ourselves that we don't. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I mean, because there are the, these sort of moments in the book when these objects, these sort of cultural texts in a way, you know, become kind of totemic, right? To, to say them that she goes and gets the Fuji's record, picking up either or picking up Kierkegaard becomes this, this, this sort of thing for her. Uh, and I wanted to ask you before we open for questions just about. Yes, books are very present, obviously, in this novel. And they're actually, I was, I was struck by, because I was rereading The Idiot last week, uh, about the ways in which they're obviously deeply present in The Idiot. But in the new book, they're sort of more visibly present in the sense that Selene will say, oh, no, I'm reading this book. This is what it's making me think about. Um, and Pushkin, right, is, is that present in this book, right? Um, Onegin. And, in the first book, right, I've, I think I've heard you say this, that in a way the, 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 the plot of that book that's sort of set off by Tatiana writing a letter to this man, that sort of sets the book in motion. And of course that's kind of what the idiot is, mm -hmm. it mirrors that, right? But in either or, she's sort of actually explicitly thinking about these characters, later it's Portrait of a Lady. Um, and I wanted to ask you if that was a kind of conscious choice in writing the book and sort of saying, okay, I'm gonna make this more overtly about the sort of books that are sort of in the galaxy of, of uh, this character's mind? Or is that very much, in a sense, drawn from life? That it's like freshman year is, okay, sort of walking through and figuring things out. And then sophomore year, it's like, oh, here's some books that actually are maybe gonna teach me how to live or at least sort of really rattle around my brain in this potent way. I think that probably played some role that, that freshman year you're just like alive, barely, and then sophomore year you're like, oh, I'm gonna read some books. But, um, but actually, I think the bigger difference was I, I wrote The Idiot, you know, close to that time and it was, it was about my, it was about the experience of living through this, this 
whatever, this, now I'm editing this in my mind and being like, I'm about to say the experience of living through the experience. <laughs> it's just, whatever. So the, the, <laughs> the second book was really more of a, like, an, a project, an idea-based project. Um, the, and it, it was also, you know, I, I, it was something that came about um, while I was having conversations like this with super smart people who made me rethink things. Uh, while I was having those conversations about the idiot, that was when I kind of realized, like, oh, this whole book was like Eugene Onegin fan fiction, and and it was um, and 2017 with the you know the feminism and the political stuff and the Me Too, I was really revisiting and rethinking the master narratives and also my narratives. I was rethinking my attachment to literature in general and my sort of like gateway texts, which were Anna Karenina and Eugene and Egan. And um, the original plan for either or, it was actually going to be, the first half was going to be a novel set in the 90s and the second half was going to be an, an essay about how novels ruined my life. And I was, um, I was thinking a lot about um, how I'd been, this was happening during the um, Kavanaugh hearing. Um, I was really thinking about, um, there's a part in The Idiot where Céline learns about government majors and that they're called govjocks and she's like, oh, so these people exist, like, huh, are they gonna be our rulers someday? And then it's just like a throwaway line and then like, you know, she never thinks about it again. And then I was watching like, you know, Brett Kavanaugh be like, I busted my butt to get onto the basketball team at Yale. And I was like, oh my God, these people are my rulers now. Like, this is exactly, and then I was like, how did that happen? And I, you know, I started to think about The Idiot as a book about depoliticization and how I thought of myself as a literature person and not a politics person. And how it was, it was partly because I saw things in, in novels that I didn't see anywhere else that actually were political, but I didn't recognize them as political. So either or was much more consciously a product of actually going back to the books that I read at the time. You know, a lot of it was, I don't know, I was just, like I was so much happier at 40 than I, than I am at 20 and I was like, you know, I'm, I'm basically a lesbian now and I was like, why didn't I do that sooner? And I, and I, I just have, you know, like more political consciousness, so I don't feel, I mean, I feel shitty because of that, but I don't feel shitty for, for not having it. And I, like why, wh how, like what, how did I draw those conclusions? So a, a big project of it was rereading those books from the time, and I actually had some of my, I didn't have either or, but I had Nadja by Andre Breton. I had my college copy, and I could see the things that I underlined, and there was a real materiality in that, and which um, I mostly read ebooks now, so I, I, I don't get that. So, um, I, and, and that made me remember that, and that's, I think that's why th you picked up on that. So. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's palpable. And there's a, there's a beautiful moment, too, in sort of thinking about sort of, uh, Celine's relationship with Svetlana, right, where there's this moment of, Celine is in this sort of thing of, oh, I need to, to for my life to be a story, I need to have these experiences that are gonna be, strange or, or upsetting or violent or whatever else. And then there's a moment, it's, it's quite poignant, where she says to Svetlana, it's like, why couldn't, why couldn't love be like this? Why couldn't we just have a slumber party without the sort of danger and violence and, and all the rest, right? And Svetlana's like in the middle of, of sort of finding a boyfriend and the relationship is changing. Um, but is that, and you, and you, you said this sort of uh, moments ago that Svetlana is drawn from life. It's someone who, who you were sort of friends with then and still still speak to, it sounds like. Um, how has your conversation with that person in real life sort of evolved over the years since then? Is that Was that conversation at that time uh, and now, how does it sort of resound? Do you share, do you share the work with Svetlana in real life before it comes out in the world? If it's not too personal. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm not sure how much to talk about. This is my only reservation about writing from my own life. Like, I don't have, I don't know, I don't have like personal boundaries, so I don't mind, you know, talking about stuff from my own life, but I don't necessarily want to um, bring in other people. I will tell you that, you know, part of the realization that I had. Uh, the, you know, that was part of the 
queer identity and the political identity and the you know the thinking about what makes narrative um, was happening when I was doing promotion for the idiot and I was thinking about the relationship between Selin and Ivan and the relationship between Selin and Svetlana and how I thought of the relationship with Ivan as the A plot and the relationship with Svetlana, like, oh, the love plot is the A plot and her best friend is the B plot. And as I was talking about the book and meeting readers and hearing readers' responses, I was just realizing how much more content there is in the relationship with Svetlana. Like, they just, they spend so much more time together, they talk about more stuff, they know each other better, they they have more of a re reciprocal relationship. And um, Yvonne, is, it's, it's all kind of proje mutual projection. Um, and then I was like, oh, so was that actually the Svetlana plot? Was that actually the A plot? And I was kind of like, no, you know, the, what was the, the actual A plot is why Svetlana was not the A plot. That's the A plot. And I also was thinking about, um, you know, the, the Silen Svetlana relationship, it survives the idiot. It doesn't survive either or. You know, those relationships with men really pull them apart. And I, in a way, I thought of either or as the Silen and Svetlana breakup book. Like, it's the story of how their friendship is not going to be able to survive more than what happens with, with Ivan. And um, and in, in real life, there there was a kind of, there was a breakup like that. and. We, we um, with, with this very close friend I had, and, um, and we're in touch now, and we were actually able to talk about it and to talk about what actually happened then, and um, I would love to write something together, I don't know, but yeah, I, and that person is like more private than I am, so it's probably not gonna happen. Yeah, I'd, I'd read it if it ever happens. Uh, you know who else I loved is, uh, Someone's Finnish friend, Juho, is that, is that how you pronounce his name? I think it's Juho. Juho. <laughs> I don't speak Finnish, but I, I was like, Juho, Juho. Anyway, he's like the guy, the morning at, like she shows up hungover, right? He's like, this is what a hangover is. This is why you're feeling this way, right? And he's a chemistry of, major, yeah. He's a chemistry, he's a chemistry major, major from like Finland, eggs. so he knows all about the alcohol and effects and interactions. He, he's got the alcohol thing down. <laughs> and he, you need reading to eat putrefied shark meat. Say again? He's like, you need to eat putrefied shark meat. That's yes, the you remedy. need to eat yeah. putrefied shark meat. That's very important. He made me think of, for, perhaps for that reason, I had a friend in college who, this Australian guy, this Croatian-Australian, who's like the math champion of Australia. You know, and these people like show up. That sounds universe. like trouble. He's, he's trouble. <laughs> and then he got into Heidegger. This was like his thing. He's like, I'm not going to do math. Oh, boy, that's all we needed. This is all we needed. Threw it. And he didn't wear shoes at all. This was his thing. I, I, could, I knew that from the beginning of the story. But he, yeah. knew, he knew he does not choose. The Drenz later we call him. But he would, this is like these people, you show up in the dining hall or wherever, and they're saying, okay, let's, let's talk about this stuff. And we have nostalgia for those people, too, that we encounter, for Yuho. Is Yuho, have, have you been on book tour to Finland? I haven't been on book tour to Finland, no. <laughs> well, we, we better make that happen. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm sure the Finns will have lots of questions about this, about you, Ho. They, they may well have. They may. The putrefied shark you know, meat and all the rest. Been a, yeah, there hasn't, it, there hasn't been, the rights haven't been sold in Finland, so that's still something that could happen. Let us, let us work on this. There's a key character in the novel from Finland. Um, on that note, I'd love to open the floor to questions. Uh, there's going to be a microphone going around. Uh, Chris here will have it. So just raise your hand, wave your hand, and we'll get a mic to you. Any questions for Elif? Oh, there everyone is. <laughs> Hi. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the difference between you and Selen and what you've learned from those differences or similarities. The differences. Selin <laughs> <laughs> is, I mean, she's based a lot on my my younger self, my memory of my younger self. A, a big reason for writing either or, and the reason that it's it's not a novel and an essay, it's just a novel, is because I don't, this is something that actually, I, I, I wrote a profile of Celine Siama, the filmmaker, and, and she was, she also didn't, you know, she didn't really think of herself as a feminist in her 20s. 
I think. And I was like, so when did you start thinking of yourself as a feminist? When did you start using the word patriarchy? She's like, I don't remember. Like, and then I, it's really hard to remember when, like to excavate in the past and be like, at this stage, I thought this, like, what did I actually think? Like, what did I actually think about, about feminism? What did I think about, I was listening to a podcast about Anita Hill and Clarence Thomas, and I was like, you know, what did I think about that? And I found my diary from 1991, but, you know, it was all about my parents' custody battle, and there was just, like, one sentence that was like, wow, Clarence Thomas is a piece of shit. And that was, like, the <laughs> only <laughs> sentence. <laughs> so, I, so I guess, you know, I, I guess I, at least I was ideologically correct on that point, but I, I don't remember the rest, and I... So a, a big part of the novel was reconstructing it, and... Um, I, I tried to keep it plausible. I definitely avoided having um, Céline reach conclusions that, you know, like so one question I get is like, well, why doesn't Céline, it, it seems so obvious that she should be a lesbian. Why doesn't that happen? And I was like, well, because it didn't happen for me and I'm, I'm interested in like, what are the historical circumstances that produce a certain life experience? So I was trying to keep it consistent. Um, that said, I think Céline is a little bit more, it's a stylized version. There are differences between how I remember I was and how Céline is. Um, I was, I think Céline has a lower bullshit tolerance than I did. I think Céline is immediately like, she's immediately like, I smell a rat here. And I think I was a little bit more like, oh, okay, maybe that person said that for a reason. Um, and Céline is, she's, she's a little bit more like, She's just asking so many more questions. And I guess what I've learned from that is that I, I kind of wish I'd been asking more questions then. Um, although in a way, you know, you can't, you can't ask all the questions as a young person that you can once you're older because you don't know anything when you're younger. Like you don't know why a table is called a table. So if someone tells you that, you're not gonna question that because it's like part of living in consensus reality. And then if someone says like, oh, a man and a woman have to live together in a house. You're like, okay, I guess that's like this thing being a table. Like it, so it's, it's, I guess I think of it as teamwork. You know, like there's things that I can question now that I couldn't question then, but there's also going into the sit-in persona lets me question things. It lets me go back to that stage of not knowing things and not, not yet knowing all the names of the things and lets me question things now that I can't question now. So yeah, I guess I think of it as teamwork. Am I calling on people because I can't completely see them? Oh, I can do it. Hi, thank you. Um, so I'm really interested in the idea of time um, with these books, thinking about the distance between the idiot and either or, you know, it was just a couple of months between the narrative and thinking, um, as you said, writing the idiot at 23 and then, you know, writing either or at closer to 40. I'm curious, thinking about the incongruencies between time there and thinking, what did you learn about Céline revisiting her and coming back to her at 40? I had sort of two revisiting sit-in experiences because one was when I edited the the idiot, I was like 37, and that was already bonkers because I, when I wrote the idiot, I just thought I was describing unmediated reality, and then at age 37, I was like, well, this appears to be a historical novel, <laughs> you know, like. <laughs> so I was already thinking about that in the, in the editing process. Um, and I did have to write some new material. It was mostly cutting and, and it was mostly cutting, but there, there were a few things to make it fit the calendar year. I did have to write some new stuff. So I was, I was thinking about that. And in either or, there actually, there were a few parts of it that I had written from that time that um, got cut out of The Idiot because they were they were later, but um, but but it w it was a real project. I guess I mean the the main difference between time then and time now is how like the book is organized in um, chapters of it's organized in terms of time. It's like the the first chapter is like the first week, and then there's the second week, and then the third like, and then I, I don't remember how exactly it goes. Then it's then it starts going by month at some point. But um, I don't know, I was just realizing that w now in my 40s, like I, 
it would have to be a whole year, you know, like I can't, like nothing happens in a week. A week is like a unit of time that's too small for anything to happen in. And I was just realizing how much more granular time was then, which was also really exciting because maybe it's possible to, to recapture that now in some way too and how much of the way that we think of time is, is sort of ideological. So yeah, that was a fun thing to think about. Didn't reach any answers. <laughs> nice, being in time. Uh, other well, we're questions. We're back at your friend. I know. Shoeless, we're back at Heidegger. He's, yeah. he's on it. <laughs> Other hands? I can't see. Yeah, right here. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I know in like your, so for In the Idiot, obviously the Dostoevsky novel isn't necessarily discussed a lot, but you can kind of see Selen like embody that sort of archetype, especially like the archetype of the protagonist. Was there any sort of Dostoevsky work you'd associate with either or? And the kind of. <laughs> I mean, I know a lot of his works are based on horrible crimes. Maybe that's a hard question, but. <laughs> um, you know, I wasn't particularly thinking of any Dostoevsky books. I wasn't even thinking of The Idiot when I wrote The Idiot. It was like, that was a title that really came when I was, was editing. And really when I was thinking about that Proust quote about how the thing that makes that time most valuable, I just realized when I was editing that book that like the, the kind of beleaguered, Anna Akhmatova, like, grievous sex stuff was, was all there to sort of distance my 23-year-old writing self from my 18-year-old self, who at 23 just looked so, like, stupid and clueless and just young and dumb and not knowing anything about anything. And then I, you know, when I, when I reread it in my 30s, I was like, oh, those were the only good parts, were the parts where she doesn't know what's going on. And the parts that are like, oh, how hard it is to be a woman and to, you know, have to get fitted for a diaphragm or whatever. There was like, no one wants to hear about it. And I, uh, and that was when I decided to call it The Idiot. And, and later, I, then I, I reread Dostoevsky's Idiot because I was like, oh, people are gonna ask me about this. And I could see a lot of similarities, like, you know, he, it's like this Prince Mushkin who is also arrives from Switzerland not knowing how anything works and has this very close friendship with this guy and then is chasing after the, he's in love with the wrong person and he's like insisting and chasing after her. And it's, it's not like there's no similarities, but, um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, I wasn't really thinking about it and um, I wasn't thinking about it with uh, either or, although now for some reason what I'm thinking of is notes from the underground, but I'm not really sure why, but that's that's all I could come up with. Although there, there's some Kierkegaard vibe with that text too, although I can't remember why. Oh, thank you, you I actually it. have my hand. You got it, good. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm really interested in um, this sort of Svetlana Riley differences. Like, I didn't remember when I read either or Riley getting mentioned in The Idiot. Maybe she comes up in passing, I don't remember. And then all of a sudden, um, Selin is living with Riley and not Svetlana. And I was curious if you could talk about like these changing friendships and like Riley's importance. Yeah, I. I initially thought, so Svetlana was based on a real person and in real life I was not roommates with that person in my second year of college. And I think because I, you know, to be honest, I think I drove that person nuts, which is something that I learned about as I was writing either or. I could see the ways that like Selin is making Svetlana completely bonkers. Um, anyway. But when I was writing the book, I initially had Svetlana be the roommate because it just, she was such a big character in The Idiot, it seemed like it, it almost didn't make sense. Like, the, th the, the book kind of starts with Satan is like, I can't wait for Svetlana to get back so I can talk to her about all the stuff that happened. And just narratively, it made so much sense for them to be roommates. But I tried to do it and it, it, it didn't work. Like, I guess that thing of having it be, um, having the book be the breakup story of Satan and Svetlana, it, it was already starting. It was already starting when they weren't roommates. When Svetlana really didn't want to be Sidin's roommate, um, so then I had to come up with with another person. Um, the women characters, I guess there's 
there's Svetlana, there's Riley, there's another friend, Lakshmi. Um, there are some other kind of peripheral roommates or, or suite mates. And they're all kind of, um, they're all in a similar plight of being young women and having to figure out how to be like a, a person in the world and, and a woman at the same time and having to negotiate sex and, and how to be smart and be a woman at the same time and how to be successful and not, you know, totally a social misfit. And, um, and they're, they're all kind of, uh, they're all, they're all, they all have very different backgrounds and that were designed to be, you know, to illustrate the different options and the different kind of strategies. So I guess a big part of Riley, you know, Svetlana is really like not American and Riley is Sidon's like most American friend. I did, she's not, Riley is not in The Idiot and I, I, I was kind of like, oh, is that a problem? Do I need to make one of the other characters in The Idiot into her roommate? And then I was like, no, because I really want to do this other character. And then I thought, it's not really, there's also another character, Ralph, who's in The Idiot, who completely vanishes in either or. And I was like, oh, do I have to like put Ralph back in there and have him doing some stuff? And then I was like, no, because like those, I don't know, each year is, it's a little bit, each year in college, it kind of goes back to the thing about time being different. It almost feels like different seasons of a TV show that it's, it's like most of the cast is the same, but some people are just different. Like when I think back about those years, there's like the cast of each year. And it, there, I really do think of different, a different configuration of people. So I thought, you know what, I'm just gonna have slightly different people. <laughs> there it is, and speaking of time, um, I'm conscious of time here. I want people to have a chance to get the book if you haven't done so, to have a drink. And uh, Elif will be here signing for a few minutes. Um, so please go out, have a beverage, raise a glass to uh, this brilliant book and this brilliant writer who we're so happy to have here at Pioneer Works. So join me in thanking. Thank you so much, this is a delight.